In 1901, the influential Admiral Alfred T. Mahan became a military advisor to President McKinley. Mahan was best known for his book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660 to 1783. In it, he illustrated how a nation's power is directly related to its naval might. He advocated updating the U.S. Navy fleet, establishing Caribbean naval bases, building a canal across the Isthmus of Panama, and increasing U.S. possessions in the Pacific. The second half of the 19th century found Spain holding tenuously to their empire. Cuba and Puerto Rico in the Caribbean. The Philippines and Guam in the Pacific. Meanwhile, in the U.S., the expansionist mood was at a fever pitch, with U.S. investments in Cuban sugar and mining industries steadily rising. In 1870, young Cuban Jose Marti had his first success as a rebel. He penned a patriotic poem against Spanish rule. The poem angered the Spanish government in Cuba so much, they jailed Marti for four months and sent him into exile. Unthwarted, Marti continued his political writing, calling for Cuban independence. It is terrible to speak of you, Liberty, for one who lives without you. A wild beast does not bend its knee before its tamer with greater fury. His tenacious spirit provided the Cuban people a national hero and hope of ending colonial rule. In 1894, Marti organized guerrilla actions, destroying U.S.-owned sugarcane plantations, hoping to provoke U.S. intervention in the Cuban plight against Spain. Spain sent an army under General Valeriano Weiler to crush the rebellion. Jose Marti was killed, but his revolution blazed on. Frustrated by rebel successes, General Weiler ordered 300,000 Cuban civilians into concentration camps. Thousands died, and the revolution seemed lost. But aid for Cuba arrived from some unlikely allies. Rival newspaper publishers William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer printed stories about the Butcher Weiler. Not out of any democratic zeal, the stories simply bolstered newspaper sales. They tried to outdo each other by printing sensational pictures and stories that fed the hysteria against Spain. Embellished stories like this became known as yellow journalism. Peter Frederick Remington was among the many reporters sent to cover the war. In 1897, Remington arrived in Havana to find there were no battles, no cavalry charges, and no artillery barrages. With no story to cover, he wired Hearst. Everything is quiet. There is no trouble. There will be no war. I wish to return. Some say Hearst replied, please remain. You furnish the pictures, and I will furnish the war. And war did come. On January 25th, 1898, the USS Maine steamed into Havana Harbor. Outwardly, its mission was to help quell the conflict between the Cubans and Spanish. On February 15th, 1898, Captain Charles Sigsby was in his cabin after dinner. His crew was below decks. Suddenly, an explosion ripped through the underbelly of the main, killing 266 men. The American headline screamed, it was a Spanish mine. Remember the Maine became a rallying cry as the American public was whipped into a frenzy. While the U.S. Congress prepared a declaration of war against Spain, forces were deployed to the Caribbean and the Pacific. Anti-expansionists protested loudly. They believed the U.S. was in danger of becoming an imperialist nation. U.S. Navy warships moved in to blockade the harbor of Havana, Cuba's capital and President McKinley issued a call for 125,000 volunteers. Infuriated, Spain declared war on the U.S. Two days later, on April 25th, the U.S. reciprocated. On the other side of the world, in the Pacific, Commodore George Dewey received orders to seek the Spanish fleet and capture or destroy it. The Philippines had been oppressed by the Spanish crown for more than 400 years, provoking many revolutions. 
When the U.S. declared war on Spain, Filipino rebel Emilio Aguinaldo saw a way for the Philippines to achieve independence. On May 1st, Dewey surprised the Spanish fleet in Manila Bay and sank all 10 Spanish ships. During the next three months, some 11,000 U.S. troops joined with the Filipino rebels to defeat the Spanish. Aguinaldo declared Philippine independence on June 12th. With the Philippines seemingly under control, U.S. troops moved on to capture Guam. Meanwhile, back in the Caribbean, the 9th Cavalry, a unit of African-American soldiers, arrived in Cuba. They found the Army quartermasters totally unprepared for the thousands of troops pouring in. Equipment was disorganized. They were issued woolen uniforms in the tropical heat. Both black and white soldiers were forced to live in unsanitary conditions with poor rations. Diseases such as yellow fever broke out and thousands were hospitalized. Of the 5,400 deaths in the Cuban campaign, only 379 were the result of combat. Teddy Roosevelt quit his desk job as Secretary of the Navy and became second in command of a volunteer regiment called the Rough Riders. They were a motley crew of some 1,200 men, including the socially prominent, cowboys, musicians, and clerks. In a critical battle, Teddy Roosevelt led the Rough Riders on a charge up Kettle Hill. They came under heavy fire, but were aided by the two regiments of African-American soldiers. They sacked Kettle Hill, but at great cost. What a sight was presented as I recrossed the flat in front of San Juan, the dead and wounded soldier. It was indescribable. In short order, the U.S. captured San Juan Hill and seized the Spanish fort while destroying Cuban ships in the Straits of Havana. With the situation in hand in Cuba and the Pacific, the U.S. now turned 18,000 troops and a naval escort on another Spanish colony in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico. They landed at Guanaca Bay, but before they could reach the capital city, Spain agreed to sign a peace treaty with the United States, putting an end to all military hostilities. The war was over in just four months. The truce with Spain was signed on August 12, 1898. It was a splendid little war, commented soon-to-be Secretary of State John Hay.